Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marisa Jones with the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Wanted to let you know that we're going to go ahead and get started in just a few minutes, promptly at 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock Eastern time, that is. Good afternoon, everyone, and or good morning, depending on where you are in the country today. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Marisa Jones, the Healthy Community Senior Manager at the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. We'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. It's Parks and Recreation Month. What does that mean for Safe Routes to School practitioners and active transportation advocates? Before we get started, a little bit about the National Partnership, in case you're not familiar with us. We're a nonprofit organization that works to advance safe walking and bicycling to and from schools to improve the health and well-being of kids of all races, income levels, and abilities, and to foster the creation of healthy communities for everyone. A little bit about what we do. We improve quality of life for kids, families, and communities, we advance policy change at the federal, state, regional, and local levels. We catalyze support for safe, healthy, active communities, and we share our deep expertise. Provide a couple of um, housekeeping items on how to use the GoToWebinar platform. On the left is the GoToWebinar viewer, where you'll see today's presentation. To the right is the control panel, where you can raise your hand, ask questions, and select your audio mode. Please note that the control panel will automatically collapse when not in use. If you want to have it open at all times, click the View menu and uncheck where it says Auto Hide Control Panel. There are two ways to listen to us today, either through your telephone or through your mic and speakers. If you're having issues with one option, I encourage you to try the other one. If you're still having trouble, just send us a chat message and we'll try our best to field those issues. Everyone's on mute today, but we want to hear your input. You can use the question box to ask, your, to ask the speakers questions for the question and answer portion at any time during the webinar. We've left plenty of time to answer your questions and we'll answer as many of them as we can at the end of the webinar. After viewing today's presentation, you might want to view it again or send the link to some of your colleagues. If that's the case, you can do it for free by going to saferoutspartnership.org, clicking on the Resources tab, and clicking on Webinars in the list on the left-hand side of the page. All past webinars are stored here for your viewing pleasure, and they're great resources, so I highly encourage you to visit this page. Now, getting into today's content, we have a great lineup of speakers today. 
I will share their in-depth bios before, their before they each present, but let's take a moment to run through who we'll be hearing from today. Danielle Sherman, who's the Healthy Parks and Places Manager at the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. Mary Raposa, who's the Director of the New Bedford Parks, Recreation, and Beaches Department in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Jesse Nessett, who's a second grade teacher in the Anchorage School District, and Molly Brenner, who's the Community Outreach Director, Director at Anchorage Park Foundation in Anchorage, Alaska. We're hosting this webinar today as a celebration of Parks and Recreation Month and to share how we're toward improving park access as aligned with and mutually supportive safe routes to school and active transportation efforts. Parks and Recreation Month is sponsored by the National Recreation and Parks Association to celebrate everything local parks and recreation has to offer. Parks are vital community institutions that help improve community and individual health by providing places for people of all ages to be physically active, while also connecting them to the outdoors and to each other. Parks offer physical, social, and mental health benefits to people playing, exercising, and spending time in them. Studies suggest that people who live within walking distance from parks use them more often, thereby reaping the benefits of physical activity on the journey to the park, as well as from spending time in and being physically active in the park. People are willing to walk about a half mile to important community destinations like parks. The safety and security of the route to the park and the quality of the park affect people's willingness to walk or bicycle there. By improving safe access to high quality parks, there is potential to improve community and individual health. Too often though, communities with the highest levels of traffic violence, crime and public safety challenges, and rates of weight related chronic disease have the least safe access to local parks. People who do not have parks within a safe walking distance or feel unsafe walking or bicycling to them are deprived of the opportunity to visit parks or put themselves in danger en route to the park. When there are not safe routes to parks, community members may walk anyway, but be subject to stress, injuries, or fatalities on the trip. These effects often have a disproportionate income on low-income communities, tribal communities, and communities of color. I'd like to start to answer the question in the title of this webinar, why does Parks and Recreation Month matter to safe routes to school and active transportation professionals by posing another question. What do active transportation advocates, safe routes to school practitioners, and parks and recreation professionals all have in common? We care about making it easier and safer for people to be outside and to be active. We care about people safely getting from point A to point B on foot or on bike. We care about creating healthy communities. There are nuanced differences in each of our approaches and strategies. Some of us care about walking and biking for recreation. Others focus on utilitarian walking and biking. We may have different end destinations in mind, schools, places of employment, parks, but at the core, our efforts align in that we're all working to make it easier, safer, more convenient, equitable, and fun to walk, bike, and be outside in our communities. Safe Routes to School practitioners, active transportation advocates, and parks professionals are all active in influencing programs, infrastructure, policies, and investments in their communities with an eye towards children's health safety, and activity levels. We all collaborate with various entities to achieve our goals. We have three great examples today of how to work, excuse me, of how working to improve local access to park ties into safe routes to school and active transportation initiatives in communities across the country. To get us started, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Danielle Sherman, who will talk about our organization, Safe Routes to Park Activating Communities Program. Danielle is the Healthy Parks and Places Manager with the Safe Routes to School National Partnership. She's responsible for advancing the Safe Routes to Parks Activating Communities Program. She has over 10 years of experience with population-based programs, 
particularly related to active transportation and health. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology from Spelman College and a Master of Public Health in Health Education and Health Promotion from Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta, Georgia. Welcome, Danielle. Thanks, Marisa, and hi, everyone. Hope you all are doing really good today. Um, so Marisa and I uh, mentioned that we work on a Safe House of Parks Activating Communities program, and through that work, we really support communities in creating safe and equitable access to parks. Um, and so just to go a little bit into what Safe Routes to Parks really, you know, what's that concept? It really ensures that people should have access to a park or green or open space within approximately a 10 minute walk or bike ride that is accessible via multiple modes of transportation for people of all ages and abilities. Secondly, that's safe from traffic and personal danger comfortable and appealing places to walk or bicycle. And then finally, that it ends at parks that are well-maintained and programmed. So when we think about how this gets done, like what's the core of the Safe Routes to Parks? This, there's a framework called Safe Routes to Parks Action Framework. And it was developed through a grant from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention provided to the National Recreation and Parks Association to support the Surgeon General's call to action on walking and walkability um, and really to provide local governments with critical evidence-based and practice-based recommendations to ensure that parks are safe, accessible, and welcoming um, places to the community. So we were invited by the National Recreation and Parks Association um, to work together with the Trust for Public Land and the American Planning Association to create this framework. And it really focuses on five stages to create safe and equitable access to parks. And just very briefly, you know, you start with engagement, um, creating a partner coalition, it includes businesses, transportation professionals, um, schools, residents, and then, you know, the engagement really is, is really intertwined into all of the other stages. And so if you look at assessment, you're assessing the environment on the way to the park, then you're using that information to develop your priorities and then develop um, your goals and the actions that you'll work on. And then from that plan, you would like to implement that plan and then work on sustaining it, whether it's securing additional funding or developing like a park, adopt a park um, maintenance program. So that's just a little bit about the whole action framework and really where this all started from. So last year, um, in 2017, we partnered with uh, the National Recreation and Parks Association to work with eight communities to pilot this framework, including New Bedford Parks, Recreation, and Beaches that you will hear from shortly. So these communities built partner coalitions, they engaged communities, they conducted walk audits, surveys, uh, selected action goals and priorities, secured funding, and they ultimately made improvements to community parks. Um, so a few key takeaways um, from last year, which uh, we'll probably share in the chat box. Um, there's a, a full article on it that was developed by the National Recreation and Parks Association. Um, and so a few of the takeaways from the, the pilot was that partnership is key and um, the central component of Safe Routes to Parks and many of the work that we do overall um, is across government agencies, community organizations, and nonprofits, and other groups. We also found that assessment is an engagement tool. So most of the communities found that although they may have been required to hold traditional community meetings regarding the project site, that interactive assessment activities not held during formal meetings were really the most effective engagement tools. Um, so these included walk audits, art in the park, community festivals, and pop-up demonstration events. So uh, during these events, uh, the partners collected qualitative feedback and really encouraged community residents to complete surveys. Um, another thing was that the most valuable aspect of planning was coordinated planning with partner coalition members, such as Safe Routes to School, trail groups, transportation departments, and local and regional planning organizations. Um, the pilot sites were able to really integrate solutions into ongoing projects of that you know the partner coalition members are working on. And then lastly, um, with this pilot um, time that we had really affirmed that the Safe Routes to Park Action Framework is effective at guiding people through this work and can be used as a reminder checklist or project guide. 
So we've used the, the lessons learned from the pilot sites uh, project to build a more robust safe routes to parks of effort. So with funding from the JPB Foundation, our organization provides coaching and technical assistance, as well as grant funds to 10 communities um, to improve safe and equitable access to parks within their communities. So we held an open request for applications and selected 10 nonprofit organizations um, that we're working on right now to improve park access, working with. Um, and during the grant period, which will end at the end of September for this, um, this grant period, the organizations um, are really receiving one-on-one -on -one coaching, tailored resources, which we're also making available publicly, and I'll share more about that at the end, um, a site visit, assistance developing a Safe Routes to Parks action plan, and grant funds to implement early actions uh, to generate interest and momentum in this plan. And so this is a map of the communities we're working with this year. It was our intent to create a diverse cohort, geographically, stage of the process, um, types of projects. So we have communities that are working on bike share access to parks, walkable access to parks, safe access to pop-up parks, um, also, our definition of safety is, is really broad. We are not only focusing on bike and pedestrian um, infrastructure, but also improving perceptions of personal safety. Um, so some of our grantees are focused on reducing gang violence in order to improve park access and utilization. And just a quick shout out for the communities that we're working with from the west side to the east side. Um, we have Portland, Oregon, and then we have three communities in California, Merced County, Los Angeles, National City. Then going down south, we have Houston, Texas, Birmingham, Alabama, Tampa, Florida. And then moving Midwest, we have Indianapolis, Indiana, and Youngstown, Ohio. Um, and then East Coast, we have Troy, New York. So if you are near or in any of those areas, um, please let us know. We would love to connect you to the work that's being done. So it's our hope that each of you on today's call will um, really see how working toward improving park access is aligned with and mutually supportive of your own efforts, and that Safe Routes to Parks really provides an opportunity to engage you know, various partners. Um, so improving safe access to parks aligns with and can strengthen Safe Routes to School and active transportation advocacy efforts. Despite the nuances in our different goals, including travel for recreation or function and, and, and different destinations, at its core, we're working on aligned efforts. So incorporating considerations of Safe Routes to Parks into your own activities may be a way to actually expand your effectiveness and reach. So, um, for example, we have you know, active transportation advocates such as transportation and city planners that have a unique role in their ability to develop strategies that really influence future changes in the community, including safe access to various destinations such as parks and open space. And then we have Safe Routes to School advocates already focused on you know, youth safely accessing schools, and in some cases, the creation of walk-to-school programs from parks to schools, and vice versa. So there are opportunities um, to engage and motivate different people or groups in, the, in this type of work. And we found this to be true um, while working with the pilot communities. Some of the technical experts who contributed to the projects included organizations with a history of working on safe routes to schools, such as law enforcement, bicycle and pedestrian advocacy organizations, and departments of transportation, as well as community partners like housing and community development, public libraries, senior centers, public schools, social service agencies, and after school groups. Um, and so lastly, wanted to share some resources with you all for Safe Routes to Parks. Um, we have a guide and training on the action framework that I mentioned earlier. We have a training on incorporating equity into Safe Routes to Parks efforts, so really breaking down incorporating equity into those phases I spoke about earlier, those stages, I should say. And then a two-page document on how Safe Routes to School practitioners and park and planning professionals um, can really address Safe Routes to Parks in, in their own work. Um, so you can find all this information along with a little bit more about um, the concept of Safe Routes to Parks as well as information on the communities we are currently supporting around this effort on our website. 
Um, and when you go to saferoutspartnership.org, you would go to the Healthy Communities tab, and then there is a tab for Safe Routes to Parks. All right, thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks so much, Danielle. And we'll be sure to send out a link, um, a direct link to those resources in the chat box. Um, so as you heard from Danielle, um, working on Safe Routes to Parks provides an opportunity to engage new partners, work with parks and recreation professionals to see the importance of extending their efforts beyond the physical parks and recreation spaces. Um, and together, there's a great opportunity to improve safe and equitable park access. And I'm really delighted to um, welcome Mary Raposa, who will share an in-depth example of working on Safe Routes to Parks. Mary Raposa is the director of the New Bedford Parks, Recreation, and Beaches Department in New Bedford, Massachusetts. Mary has a great love of public spaces and engaging children and adults in the great outdoors for health and recreation. Her commitment to improving the quality of life and health for all New Bedford residents through, through the development of citywide recreational opportunities and beautiful safe open spaces is reflected in the new park construction and park rehabilitations that have occurred during her tenure as the director of the Parks Department. Mary's experience as a landscape designer and environmental educator brings a rich background to her position as director. Mary received a graduate certificate in landscape design from the Landscape Institute at Harvard University. Following that, she worked as a professional landscape designer for 12 years, designing and overseeing installation of private estates and commercial sites. Previously, Mary was the education coordinator at the Children's Museum in Dartmouth. She oversaw 60 acres of conservation land and created edu environmental education programs for families and school groups. Welcome, Mary. Thank you, Marissa, and uh, thank you all for joining us today. New Bedford is an urban city of approximately 95,000 people located on 20 square miles of land. We're on the coast just before you get to Cape Cod. We have a little bit more than seven acres of parkland per resident. We know that transportation is a barrier for many of our families and most of our youth, so it's imperative that we provide safe routes to parks for the population. We were really thankful to be selected for the pilot project for the safe routes to parks. Uh, we used the action framework throughout the year. It was a great tool. Um, City of New Bedford is also participating in the 10-minute walk to park initiative. The two leads on the pilot project were the New Bedford Parks, Recreation and Beaches Department and Mass in Motion New Bedford. Mass in Motion is a Department of Health funded Massachusetts initi initiative. And since 2010, Mass in Motion has been working with the New Bedford Public Schools on safe routes to school effort across the city. So they conducted walk audits, uh, had community engagement, and did a lot of partnership building. And we saw that there was a natural progression to move into the safe routes to parks and were able to build on the relationships that the safe routes to schools partnership already had, including with key departments such as planning, Department of Public Infrastructure, traffic department, regional transportation partners, and uh, state organizations as well. We were also able, we were able to access all of those partners and get them on board fairly easily because they all understood um, the importance of providing safe pedestrian access to public amenities. We also identified and reached out to other potential partners who came on board, including the United Way, who had an initiative in this neighborhood as well. Two elementary schools, one directly across the street from the park and one two blocks away. Uh, the ward counselor for this area, the New Bedford Police Department, Walk Boston, and the Council on Aging. We conducted three community dinners in partnership with the United Way where we were able to solicit input from residents on the existing conditions in and around the park. We also hosted an additional community dinner at the park to really focus in on specific sites in the park and surrounding area and times that really we needed to focus on for the walk audits. 
we met with the school administration and neighboring businesses, and they really helped us to get the word out for um, ongoing community engagement opportunities such as the walk audits. We included um, all of our information was in three languages, and we had two bilingual staff that were on hand for the community engagement pieces, including the walk audits and the dinners. And this really allowed us to have broad public participation in the process. So we, um, we included uh, government agencies, community-based organizations, the police department, the schools, neighborhood groups, the businesses. Um, we really wanted to make sure that we were engaging community members in the neighborhood throughout the process and that the community members were really representative of the neighborhood, including underrepresented and high-need populations. We selected Ashley Park as our pilot project site. It's a 5.1 acre park in a dense urban neighborhood uh, bordered by multifamily homes, shops, businesses, an elementary school. And we know through park surveys that we conducted both at the park and online that most of the park users are walking or taking public transportation to get here. There are 10 streets that intersect or terminate at the park. The neighborhood is a diverse environmental justice population neighborhood that qualifies under high minority and low income. So we felt all of these factors really made it an ideal location for a pilot project and to create a template for safe routes to parks that we could use throughout the city. So many of the potential concerns that we would run into were present here at this park. The walk audits were developed for us by Walk Boston. Uh, they had a lot of experience developing walk audits throughout the state and also in New Bedford for the Safe Routes to Schools initiative. At the walk audits, we had city staff representing multiple departments. Uh, walk Boston staff was present, and then we also had community partners. And as I said, we had uh, bilingual translators. Uh, we did two walk audits on the same day. We did an afternoon walk audit and an evening walk audit. Um, we decided to do two after we had um, had the focus groups because uh, residents were indicating that the afternoon there was a lot of traffic and um, some speeding. And then in the evening they were concerned about low light levels. The police department, the planning department, and the Department of Public Infrastructure are really key partners to have on board um, as they will implement many of the changes in infrastructure and policy that we would um, identify during the walk audits and throughout the process. And so having them involved really made sure that they understood the issues and the community's concerns uh, going forward. In addition to the surveys and the walk audit data, we uh, collected additional information for our analysis. The Department of Public Infrastructure was able to provide us with GIS maps that showed um, all the city trees, lights, wheelchair ramps, bike lanes. Um, the police provided us with traffic and crime statistics in the area. The Regional Planning Office was able to get us crash clusters and um, the walk audits, of course, provided some uh, real and um, perceived safety concerns that the neighbors had. So taking all of that data, we uh, reviewed it and came up with recommendations for short, mid, and long-term solutions. Um, within the park, we identified that we needed to do another master plan for the park. The existing amenities do not meet the needs of the current um, community. Um, some of the amenities we need to address um, include ADA compliance, the type of uh, athletic uh, facilities that are being provided, uh, signage, wayfinding. In the um, roads leading up to the park, we um, identified maintenance, uh, street design, signage as well, um, crosswalks, sidewalks. We created a logo for our um, Safe Routes to Parks initiative, and the intention is that we will um, use the logo on buildings and sidewalks along Safe Routes to Parks as we identify those and develop them throughout the city. 
we wanted to make sure we had some quick wins so that residents would know that we heard their concerns and we were able to improve lighting in the plaza in the park pretty quickly using existing infrastructure. We also removed a damaged fence that was identified as a safety concern. Uh, one of the other great quick wins we got was the Department of Public Infrastructure, because they were on the walk audit, they, um, one of the concerns was a street that runs alongside the elementary school and directly into the park had sidewalk only on one side of the street. The Department of Public in Infrastructure was actually going to be working in that area in the near future and had not identified that as a concern. So they were able to add that sidewalk into their plan before they were executing it. We wrapped up the Safe Routes to Parks public process with an Ashley Park pop-up day where we had games for the kids. We did a pop-up parklet where we extended the curb to cut down on the um, distance across an intersection that has a lot of traffic, both pedestrian and vehicular. Um, we did an enhanced crosswalk on an, another street that dir directly leads from the elementary school into the park. We had um, partners who had health information tables, there were activities, we even had some music. We timed the pop-up uh, demonstration and activity day with the release time of the two elementary schools so that we would we knew that there would be increased family participation at the event. Also at that time of day we knew that there was uh, vehicular and pedestrian traffic and so it made the pop-up demonstration really informative and very visible to the community. So going forward to sustain the effort we were developing a Safe Routes to Parks policy template and the, this will be shared with all the city departments that are involved in environmental improvements and planning near parks. And um, that would include, of course, uh, the Department of Infrastructure, the Planning Department. Um, we also are, will be sharing it with regional entities so that as they develop plans such as master plans and open space and recreation plans, transportation plans, going forward, they will have this template to review. Um, so that they can include the safe routes to parks in, into their planning process. And um, we currently have a grant pending. We're working with the community health center to identify health disparities near parks and to see how access to parks impacts that. And so we're really excited to be able to continue the work on safe routes to parks in New Bedford. Mary, thank you so much for sharing all this great work that you did through the safe routes to parks pilot program. I absolutely love how you talked about the progression of New Bedford's active transportation efforts and how it all stemmed from working on safe routes to school, uh, building on the relationships that you all cultivated while working on safe routes to school, and then using that to improve active travel to other community destinations like parks. Um, I really love the timing of the pop-up um, timed with school dismissal, which we know is a challenging time for a lot of um, schools, and often that's a time that um, traffic safety concerns are at their highest, and so it's great to see that you timed the pop-up um, accordingly. And then also really appreciate that you highlighted um, the quick wins and how those were used to um, keep community members engaged and really show that their participation in the walk audits and these dinners and providing feedback um, wasn't just going out into the abyss, was really being listened to and um, that you all took action accordingly. So thank you so much for that. Thank um, you, my pleasure. Yeah, um, and you know, Mary also talked about walk audits and um, we will share a link in the chat box. We just today released a new tool on walk audits specifically for Safe Routes to Parks. Um, so our first public unveiling is this webinar. We will share that through the link. Um, with that, I'd like to turn to one of the most in innovative initiatives I've heard of that bridges Safe Routes to School, active transportation, and park access. And that is Anchorage Park Foundation's Schools on Trails initiative. So we um, will welcome two people to talk about that, Molly Brenner and Jesse Nesset. Um, their bios are as follows. Jesse Nesset has taught in Alaska for the last six years and in Montana for the year before that. 
she is outside with her husband and dog on the trails or the rivers every chance she gets. Integrating the curriculum and outdoors into her lessons has been one of the most rewarding and invigorating things she has done to strengthen her teaching practice and student engagement. Molly Brenner fell in love with the outdoors on a sixth grade trip to the Canyonlands in Utah. She loved hiking, stargazing, and not having to shower. Her interest in health and recreation led her into a master's in public health and a career in related initiatives, working for both the United States House and Senate and several health associations, including the American Nurses Association and the American Academy of Family Pediatrics. Molly moved to Anchorage three years ago and dove into working with community partners to grow the inclusive play, Health on Trails, Schools on Trails, and Park Rx initiatives for the Anchorage Park Foundation. Welcome, Molly and Jesse. Hello, thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. And thanks Marisa and Safe Routes to School Partnership for inviting us um, to talk about our Schools on Trails initiative. So I just wanted to give everyone on the phone a little background on Anchorage in case you haven't been here. Um, drop everything, now's a great time to get on a plane and come up here. Um, especially because we have great weather while well, I think the rest of the country is either hot or rainy. Um, but just to give you a sense of Anchorage, um, it is 300,000 people. Um, we have 27 Title I schools. And what makes Anchorage really special and what we call our crown jewel is our trail and park system. We have 250 miles of trails and 90 parks. Um, unfortunately, with that and Anchorage being um, a city and where um, a lot of our services are, we do have a high rate of crime, which a lot of people don't know about Anchorage. And it does deter um, park visits and is something that um, we're aware of when we're trying to get school-aged children out to parks. So um, Schools on Trails is an initiative that is housed where I work at the Anchorage Park Foundation. Um, and the mission of the Anchorage Park Foundation is to build healthy parks, healthy people by mobilizing public support and financial resources for Anchorage parks, trails, and recreation opportunities. So while we have um, many other programs we're working on, Schools on Trails is one of our um, shining programs that has been um, a cornerstone of the Anchorage Park Foundation for quite some time. So the mission of Schools on Trails is um, reflected in my favorite Calvin and Hobbes um, comic right here, where we're really trying to get kids out um, on the trails in our parks more familiar, um, throughout the whole year, which is definitely a challenge as Anchorage, as you may have guessed, is a winter city, um, especially during the school year. So um, we have several things that we're really working on with Schools on Trails, and that's to identify and raise awareness of trails, parks, and streams, and natural habitats that are near Anchorage schools, um, and to connect schools and families to these nearby public spaces and encourage outdoor educational opportunities. Then we also want to engage staff and students in creation, planning, and implementation of improvement projects. And then we really strive to involve students in each step of the process as real life lessons in civic engagement and project management. We leverage school interests for project fundraising and long-term long success. And we provide continuing education incentives to school staff and other volunteers for professional participation. So the vision of what we're trying to get to um, with Schools on Trails is to engage Anchorage schools again um, to educate students and staff about community assets and enrich neighborhoods through increased local awareness. We want to establish connections with students and create opportunities to share in civic engagement, participate in the project planning process, foster stewardship, of our lands and instill the value of safe public spaces as a key component in the quality of life. So a history of schools on trails is that it actually started um, with a part-time employee here at the Anchorage Park Foundation that was um, AmeriCorps funded. And then um, she 
initially started the program reaching out to schools um, and seeing how she could engage those various schools um, to get students outside. And because of her success, and I think Jesse will talk about a specific project and go through that with you guys, but because of um, the success of this part-time employee, we really were able to get more funding um, and make her position um, uh, not a permanent part-time position here at Anchorage Park Foundation. Um, and that was because we did get funding um, from the Forest Service, the National Park Service, and then a local foundation um, in Anchorage called the Rasmussen Foundation also contributes um, to the sustainability of the Schools on Trails program. Um, we do field trips as part of um, our grant with the Forest Service. It's the Every Kid in a Park EKIP grant that um, we're able to fund some of our schools on trails work. Um, and then, uh, so we take kids um, to the outdoors and on um, like hikes and glacier tours and things like that where um, these children may not have explored uh, the outdoors like that um, before. So they get to see a little bit more of Alaska than they normally would. And then for the National Park Service, the funding we get from there is from the Rivers, Trails, and Conservation Assistance Program, um, specifically the Urban Agenda. Um, and then through the Rasmussen Foundation, um, a lot of the projects that have been funded through them is what's called our Challenge Grants, um, which is they um, fortunately give us um, some money to then be doled out to local neighborhoods. And uh, we've used, it, used that money for several Schools on Trails projects where schools come to us or teachers, principals come to us and are interested in um, certain projects that would benefit their students and encouraging them to get outdoors. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jesse Nesset to talk about a specific project that we've done with Schools on Trails. That was her project. Hello. So I was asked to talk about the project I did with my second graders a few years back. Um, this project helped launch Schools on Trails within um, the Anchorage Park Foundation. Um, and it all kind of started when I moved up from Montana to Alaska. I'd already had a love for the outdoors. Um, Alaska was much different, bigger mountains, ocean, glaciers. Um, I started by asking my students one day who had seen a glacier in real life. Uh, I was heartbroken to find out that only three of my 20 students knew that they had seen a glacier or could tell me a detail about a glacier. I worked at a school um, called Nunaka Valley. It is a Title I school located on the east side of Anchorage. Nunaka Valley is immediately adjacent to um, a park entrance called Russian Jack Springs Park. Uh, I started by taking a course called ITREC, which stands for Iditarod Trail to Every Classroom, which was teaching teachers how to use place-based service learning while incorporating the Iditarod, um, the historic Iditarod Trail. Our school was not near the Iditarod Trail, but as Molly said, we have so many miles of trails within our cities, I could get my kids on a trail. Uh, after finding out that only three of my 20 students had seen a glacier, I then asked them how many knew where Russian Jack Springs Park was. Three students knew there was a park across the street. Uh, in an impressive feat, we surveyed the whole school, finding that only 36% of the students in the school knew that there was a park. Um, and then it started. So... Right through the tunnel, um, you actually enter the park. But because you get to the other side of the park and there are no wayfinding signs, um, you know, you tend to get lost. So there's a quote from one of my students. My class and I got lost because there are no signs, so we did not know we were in Russian Jack. Now, as we continued on, we got to multiple intersections and proceeded to get lost multiple times. Um, finding that there were no wayfinding signs and that the park was not very user-friendly for students to find their way to school or during class or on the weekends. So they probably aren't going out on the, this trail or in the park on their own time. Um, without the sign acknowledging that there was an entrance to the park, we didn't know if we were even in the park yet. 
a lot of my students assumed that a park meant there was a playground. Uh, so they were, as you can see, looking around, trying to find where the park might be. Where do we go? Maybe we should help put up some signs. We started our outdoor learning um, through walking around the park and finding a place to learn. Um, then my students came up with a motto, leave no trace, enjoy our learning space. And I think people would understand that we're trying to learn out here in nature without gross stuff. So my students really started trying to work on their stewardship, um, becoming more of an advocate for their community, walking through the tunnel, seeing graffiti and then garbage on the ground really upset them. So they started, um, we went back to the classroom and we researched Anchorage Parks and we came upon Anchorage Park Foundation. We found the executive director uh, name, Beth Nordland, and my students and I decided to write letters. Um, I'm going to read one real quick. First, I want to help clean Russian Jack Springs Park so it won't look like no one ever littered there. I want to invite you on Wednesday on one of our nature walks. Our school is at Nunaka Valley Elementary. Next, our wonder my wonderful teacher is wondering if our class can also have a learning space. If we have a space with a picnic table, we can learn about nature. Last, we'd like to put up signs that say, welcome to Russian Jack Springs Park. This, these letters sparked um, a lot of interest with Mrs. Beth Nordland, and therefore we um, entered into when, um, the opportunity for a challenge grant through the Rasmussen Foundation. Um, from there, my students began to speak at community council meetings with me and go to different meetings with the Parks and Rec. Having um, support from the administration was the most crucial thing for me to get out on the trails, knowing that what I was doing out there wasn't just fluff. Uh, a lot of people associate going outside with fun activities um, and not necessarily rich learning. I received a lot of uh, kickback from my peers of other teachers, but um, as soon as I could prove that learning was happening and that my students were safe, uh, the school did not give me as much trouble. Uh, we always carried cell phones and walkie-talkies uh, and had multiple chaperones. So this was the biggest part, support from the community members and parents. Um, Anchorage is known for its stunning views, trails, wildlife, and diverse population. But as Molly said, it is also known for its crime. Um, Russian Jack Springs Park is on the east side of Anchorage, um, which is known for being a little bit more dangerous. In order to bring my students into the park, I needed to have the support from the community, the parents, and the administration. I created a chaperone pool. Um, every Wednesday at 2 o'clock, we'd walk out into the park. Sometimes if I had a longer activity, we'd go earlier. But parents who are weary of it at all received personal invitations written by the students. And then if they were able to come, they soon saw the benefits of having my students out on the trails. Um, all parents received a newsletter explaining the objectives and the pros to outdoor learning. I provided a map and a timeline for the lesson. I also used the Remind and Homeroom app to text families when we were heading out and when we got back. Um, that created a little sense of you know, safety in their hearts, knowing that their babies were safe. Um, they were also asked to sign a walking field trip form. So of my 20 students, all parents signed the form. I didn't have a whole lot of problems getting those back. Um, and then again, I encouraged all family members to join. So even if mom couldn't come, maybe auntie or uncle could come to go on a walk and see the benefits. So of course, I think there are benefits to getting kids outside um, and learning. I needed to prove that to the school district and the community. Um, students developed a sense of ownership of the public lands in the neighborhood. They really became the strongest stewards in our community. They spoke at multiple community council meetings where I didn't feel I had the confidence to. They stood up and spoke. Um, and then they also spoke at a parks and Rec recreation meeting. Uh, we then linked going outside to an incentive with our attendance. We needed to have 95% attendance in order to go outside each week. 
uh, in a Title I school, attendance is a little bit challenging, and our school was sitting around 75%. So our principal asked, what can we do? And I said, well, I can link it to going outside, and my attendance rates increased, which then so did the math and reading scores because they were at school, which is, you know, all that some people really care about. Um, these are some really great quotes from some of my students at the community council meetings or talking to Mrs. Beth Nordlin or um, meeting with landscape architects. So my favorite one, it's kind of a big opportunity for us because we're just little kids. We're just trying to make a difference in our community and we need your help. Or we are just stewards doing stewardship. And the best is, guess what, Miss Nessa? I walked on our trail to school today. So giving kids the tools to feel safe on their trails and also giving them some direction. Um, they started walking on their trails to school instead of taking the bus or walking on the sidewalk. After receiving the challenge grant from Rasmussen Foundation, uh, we decided to start with a map. As you can see, Nunaka Valley is right here and there's one tunnel and you come into the intersection. Um, we started out by wayfinding signs and then alerting space inside the park. These maps gave um, the community, the school, and students a little bit more ownership, but also made them feel more comfortable using the park on a day-to-day -day basis. After this map was created, multiple schools started to request them through the Anchorage Park Foundation and Schools on Trails, and there are a few more here of some neighboring schools. Some of these have some student input on them, whether or not the teacher was really involved or a teacher at the school. Um, some of them have how many kid feet it is, how many kindergarten steps it is, how many fifth grade steps it is to their destination. And then finally, we were able to get some wayfinding signs in place. So as you can see, in the top left, there's the tunnel that we walk through and then a welcome sign saying that we're finally in the park. And then there are signs indicating where our school is, where the learning labs are. And then in the top right is a picture of the actual learning lab that was created um, for us to go out every week and learn. And then there are additional links here that I'm sure will be shared um, if you wanted to look at the project in particular or other trails maps. And then there are a couple articles about getting kids outside in Anchorage. And that's all. Thanks, guys. Great. Thanks so much, um, Jesse and Molly. Really appreciate you sharing this um, great project. Um, there's definitely alignment with uh, Save Routes to School. I think for Save Routes to School folks on the phone, you probably can relate to the use of students as advocates, the need for volunteers, and also how the Schools on Trails programs address parental fear, which we know is one of the biggest barriers to parents allowing their kids to walk and bike. Um, and it also aligned with research that shows that physical activity can reduce absenteeism. So it was really cool to see how Jessie built that into her program design. So we've got a bunch of questions that have come in and welcome people to continue asking questions in the chat box. And before we do that, um, and actually a lot of people have asked about future funding opportunities. So I want to highlight a couple of, um, quickly highlight a couple of aligned initiatives and funding opportunities. So one of them is the Cities Connecting Children to Nature initiative, um, which is a collaboration between the National League of Cities and the Children of Nature Network. And it helps city leaders and their partners ensure that all children have the opportunity to play, learn, and grow in nature from urban parks and community gardens to the great outdoors. Another aligned initiative and upcoming funding opportunity is through the 10 Minute Walk Campaign, which is a nationwide movement led by the Trust for Public Land, National Recreation and Park Association, and the Urban Land Institute to ensure that there's a great park within a 10 minute walk of every person in every neighborhood in every city across the country. Uh, there's an upcoming grant opportunity led by the National Recreation and Parks Association 
to support 10 cities to develop 10 minute walk commitments and plans for action. And this application will open at the end of September. I also wanna note that Anchorage, Alaska is a member of the first cohort of these grantees. Um, and the third initiative that Danielle um, highlighted, um, the Safe Routes to Parks Activating Communities Program offers in-depth coaching and technical assistance, as well as $12,500 in grant funding to communities to develop Safe Routes to Parks action plans and begin to implement early actions from these plans. And the second round of grant funding will be released in the late fall and early winter of 2019. Um, so I want to take some time now to answer some of the questions that have come in. Um, so one of the questions that came in um, is for Molly and Jesse, but um, I guess if anybody else has things to add to. So um, in our school district, we get lots of pushback from parents who say it's too cold and too dark for kids to walk in the winter, but it must be colder and darker in Alaska. How do you do it? Um, well, I guess I haven't had the too dark um, comment because people do know we live in Alaska and it, you're right, it is darker. Um, in the winter, we our sun does not rise till about 1030 and it sets before school is out. Um, we still go outside. The too cold part, I think that if um, we have regulations by the school district of when it's too cold for recess, and that's negative 15. So if it's negative 15 degrees, I probably am not going to be taking 20 to 30 kids outside to begin with. Um, I have not had a whole lot of pushback from parents on that, but I just say we're going to bundle up and we're going to be moving, so they'll stay warm. Okay, thanks for that. So I think the takeaway is um, it's, uh, if they can do it in Alaska, we can probably do it yeah. in other states. Well, and some um, of it, but some of it, just real quick, is to do some education around that, I think helps out um, making sure that people know what are appropriate layers or um, especially like lighter colors, reflective gear, that sort of thing. We've done mm -hmm. some education around that as well. Great, thank you. Um, this is a question for Mary. Um, says, I appreciate your thoughtfulness to park selection. Was there a specific place that you gathered the data from? The data regarding um, the park, we, we had already identified that park um, through some park surveys that we had done initially before the process as a park that had, um, was actually drawing from a much bigger neighborhood uh, community than we had originally thought. And as I said, most people were walking there. We also have a relationship with that elementary school because we have had after school <laughs> programs there. So we had a lot of data on that park and we had already identified a lot of the concerns. So when the Safe Routes to Parks opportunity came up, it just, it was a natural to go right to Ashley Park. Okay, that's great. Do you have, um for folks who might not already have the park selected or might not have um, those relationships in place, do you have any ideas or recommendations, sorry to put you on the spot, of places that they might go to gather some of that data to help them with park selection? Sure. Um, as I said, we had um, actually, we were in the park doing park surveys the summer before. We um, work closely with the elementary school, so if there's any schools there, I would recommend that. And then just, you know, the familiarity familiarity with our parks. Um, as I said, this park has businesses across the street. It has a, a very dense um, residential neighborhood right abutting it. There were just uh, so many streets coming into it. It just, um, just had so many of the concerns that we thought we would find at any of the parks were present at this one park. And um, so it just seemed like the best place to develop a template. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Molly and Jesse, do you have anything to add to that about how you select um, the schools that you work with for schools on trails? Um, a lot of times it is the schools that come to Anchorage Park Foundation requesting now. Um, now that we do have a coordinator position, there is a little bit more opportunity. Sometimes um, as I work this summer with Anchorage Park Foundation as a schools on trails coordinator, I've been reaching out to different schools who maybe don't have a map or a learning lab 
and see if that's something that's interesting to them. Um, and I often come with the park that's already next to their school, easily accessible to encourage the outdoor learning. Great, thank you. Um, so I know with the Schools on Trails program, you talked about um, having volunteer chaperones, and I'm guessing that those are parents. So we have a question about how can, and this is for both, this is for any of the speakers, um, how can community volunteers help to implement programs that Im help improve park access? Um, well, I'll jump in real quick. Our chaperone pool is not necessarily um, our parents because we're in a Title I school. Um, a lot of our parents are working more than one job or unable to attend due to lack of transportation. Um, we have a chaperone pool that actually consists of professionals in the community. We have a lot of organizations that actually encourage their employees to donate their time or volunteer. And we just tapped into a whole lot of different um, businesses asking if they could volunteer for an hour once a month or a week or if they wanted to be on a rotating call. Um, and then they are able to fill out a form through the district, you know, um, a background check and able to chaperone. And we have also Great. found um, a lot of our landscape architects in town um, are very quick to jump on board and help with any of our projects in terms of volunteerism. Oh, that's terrific. Well, I'm, I'm sorry to curtail our question time. We um, have to wrap things up, but I want to invite folks, um, if you're interested in keeping the conversation going, we're having a tweet chat tomorrow, July 25th at two o'clock Eastern time. We have a bunch of great co-hosts. Um, and we'll also be sending out a survey following this webinar. Um, we ask that you please take it. Um, it really informs our future development of the webinar series. Um, and with that, we really thank all of our speakers, Danielle, Mary, Jesse, Molly, and thank all of you for attending the webinar. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks.